Hi, I'm Kevin McCarthy, the Chief Technology Officer for Dover Motion. In this video, we'll be exploring a number of formulas related to automated digital microscopy and touching on topics such as the sensor choice, sensor size, magnification, field of view, pixel sizes, resolution, depth of field, and numerical aperture. When it comes to sensors, we have a wide variety of digital imaging sensors these days to choose from. This CCD camera or charge coupled device has a fairly small sensor and might be four or $500. At the cutting edge, things get considerably larger and considerably more expensive. This is an example of a electron multiplying deep cooled CCD camera. In this case, there's an additional stage after the output stage, which amplifies the signal, allowing us to see single photons. A sensor of this type is also deeply cooled to about minus 40 degrees C, which also happens to be minus 40 degrees F. And a camera like this can go for upwards of $30,000. Now, in recent years, CCDs have been eclipsed by some remarkable advances in CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductor sensors. We have an example here. This is liquid cooled to remove the heat. Again, it's uh, got Peltier coolers inside it that lower the temperature to about minus 40 degrees. The sensor is a 5.5 megapixel CMOS. And these have actually come in at a very attractive price point compared to the electron multiplying cameras of the past. In all of these cases, the sensor is going to have a particular size, and we generally talk about the diagonal measure. So for a sensor, they may in many cases be rectangular. We're really looking at the diagonal measure. And if the sensor diagonal was, say, 20 millimeters, and if the magnification of the objective was 20x, then we simply divide the two, and we have a field of view of one millimeter. And that's fairly typical for microscopy applications. In addition to the magnification reducing the size of the sensor down to the size of the field of view on the sample, it also does the same with the pixels. So for example, if we had four micron pixels, and a 40x objective, that would be 0.1 micron of geometric resolution, or 100 nanometers. But it turns out it isn't quite that simple. There's a property of light, which is that in addition to acting like a particle, the photon, it also has a wave property. And the wave nature of light leads to a condition called diffraction. And with diffraction, limits are set on resolution. And to better understand how that works, we need to explore another concept, which is called numerical aperture. I'll draw a variety of microscope systems. These are objectives. Low power, 4x medium power, 40x, and high power, 100x. Here is the sample, and generally speaking, the distance from the end of the objective to the sample, which is called the working distance, is going to be long on a low power objective, less on a higher power, and very fine, possibly a fraction of a millimeter, in the high power system. What's critical here is the angle the sample is illuminated and light is coming out of it. And in the case of the shorter working distance, higher numerical aperture objectives, that light is coming at an increasingly higher angle. And this is really critical. So if we draw that one more time with a bigger scale, here is our sample and this angle if we take the half angle, which is here, the numerical aperture of the objective 
abbreviated as Na, equals the sine of this half angle. We'll call it theta divided by two, where theta is the entire angle. For a 4x system, the numerical aperture is going to be very low. It might be on the order of 0.05 to 0.1. In a 40x system, it could be in the range of 0.5 to 0.8. And a high power system, it could get up as high as 0.9 or 0.95. As long as there is air between the objective and the sample, you can never get to or exceed one for numerical aperture. But there is an interesting twist, and that is you can introduce a liquid in between the cover slip and the objective. And if you do this, you can either use water or oil. With water, you can get up to about a 1.1 numerical aperture. And by the use of oil, this is called oil immersion, you can get the numerical aperture up to as high as 1.47. Now, this is quite a range of values from 0.05 to 1.47, but it is absolutely essential in terms of defining the real resolution and also the depth of field. On the previous example, we considered a sensor with four micron pixels and 40x magnification, and that is technically 100 nanometer geometric resolution, simply the size of the pixel divided by the magnification. The formula for diffraction limited resolution is the resolution will equal 1.22 times lambda, the wavelength of light, divided by two times the numerical aperture. If we use a wavelength for lambda, for light, of 0.55 microns, which is yellow-green light, it turns out that the diffraction-limited resolution is not 100 nanometers, but is actually about 412. So when we're reading these pixels, we are oversampling by a factor of four. And while some oversampling is appropriate, that's really a bit much, you're wasting pixels. To better understand how diffraction limits you, we should actually show a brief demonstration. If light moved strictly in straight lines, then if you had a pinhole and you illuminated it with some light, you would get a straight beam. That would be the direct light. Similarly, if you had the equivalent of a comb, black and clear, black and clear, black and clear, very fine pitched, and you've shown light through that, all that should happen when you pass the light through a comb is that you ought to see the same spot of light, but it'll be dimmer because some of it got blocked by the comb elements. Such a comb is a common property of linear optical encoders that are used to measure the position of stages. We happen to have a linear optical encoder here. The lines occur at a pitch of eight microns. And according to geometric optics, if I shine a laser on it, which has a spot about like yay, I should see the same spot, but it should be about half as bright because half of the combs won't be reflecting. But that's not what we see. We see not a single dot, but a lot of dots, uniformly spaced. What's happening there is because of the wavelength nature of light, the light is being diffracted by the grating, and instead of going straight up, it's spreading out into a cone. We just saw the diffraction that is caused by a linear encoder, which is essentially a straight line of comb. The sample has structure in two dimensions, and it diffracts not just in one line, but in an entire cone. We have a piece of two-dimensional XY grid encoder here, and if we put a laser on this, you'll see a very nice diffraction pattern, many orders in two dimensions. So that's what the fine structure of your sample is doing. It's throwing light out in all directions, and the job is to collect as much of that as possible with the objective. And the way to do that is to have a high numerical aperture, a big, wide cone.
In this case, we have light coming out in a cone. So what's going on is, if you don't collect a wide angle of the cone, if you do a very narrow cone, let's imagine a very long working distance, low power objective, where the sample is down here, and this angle is very small, then you're pretty much merely getting the light that's going straight through. But just as the lines on that linear encoder diffracted light into a wide cone, so do the miniature features on your sample. Could be cells, could be chromosomes, could be nuclei, but all of that fine structure spreads the light out. Zero order is the light that goes straight up. The first order, the second order, the third order, the fourth order. And just with Fourier systems, where you take a square wave and resolve it into a bunch of sine waves, unless you're catching all of those higher orders, you cannot synthesize a high resolution image. That is why numerical aperture is the key of getting high resolution. The geometric resolution, the size of your pixels and the magnification of your objective isn't really what's going on. It's ultimately set by this number here. Now there is one other variable here that you can adjust. By going to bluer light, you can also increase the resolution. But for a particular application, that might not be possible. So generally speaking, for any given objective, you're going to want to pay to get the highest possible numerical aperture. Although, as we'll see in a moment, there is a slight downside to that. The other consequence of numerical aperture is that it directly relates to the depth of field. If we have an objective looking at a sample, there's a particular plane of perfect focus. And an open question is, how far above and below that plane can we be and still have everything fully resolved? The same thing occurs in traditional photography. If you go to a very small aperture, you'll increase your depth of field. As we go to a higher numerical aperture, we get higher resolution, but we do pay a bit of a price in that the depth of field becomes considerably smaller. So there's a distance above the sample plane and a distance below the sample plane. And anywhere within them, we have essentially perfect focus. As soon as we get outside of that boundary, we begin to blur the image. This is called the depth of field. The formula for the depth of field is lambda, the wavelength of light, times the square root of the index squared minus the numerical aperture squared divided by two times the numerical aperture squared. This is a nonlinear affair, and you really want a spreadsheet to calculate this. And we've got a very nice one that we'll be addressing in another video. So n is the refractive index of the material between the objective and the sample. In most cases, that's air, and n equals 1.00. When we go to higher numerical aperture and higher resolution for water, its refractive index is 1.33. And then finally, if we use a specialized immersion oil for microscopy, N will equal 1.52. For a low magnification objective, such as a 4x or even a 10x, you could often have a depth of field of plus or minus three to five microns. In that case, if your sample is very flat, you may not need to focus at all, or rather focus once and just leave it. Generally speaking, samples vary in thickness, they vary in flatness, so we usually want to focus. So this would be a four to 10x. If we look at a 20x, which can be numerical aperture of, say, 0.6 to 0.8. The depth of field now drops, and it could be on the order of plus or minus 500 nanometers. As we move into high magnification with oil immersion at a numerical aperture of 1.47, the depth of field drops very dramatically, and the depth of field could be plus or minus 0.1 to 0.2 microns. That's a very tight tolerance. If you're down around 100 nanometers or 150 nanometers, very tiny changes in flatness of the sample, 
or in the height of the sample or in the precision of the guideways of the XY sample motion stage make it tricky to stay in focus. That's why a continuous tracking laser autofocus with a high bandwidth focusing stage such as the DOF-5 is really the ideal way to maintain focus in these high numerical aperture, high resolution applications. As we've seen, if you want high resolution, you're going to need a high numerical aperture. And one of the consequences of that is a fairly small depth of field, which places an emphasis on the quality and performance of your focusing stage. These requirements led us to develop the DOF-5, which stands for Dover Objective Focuser, five millimeter stroke, but as per the discussion we've just gone through, can also stand for depth of field. The resolution of this stage with five millimeters of stroke is one and one quarter nanometers. To put it in perspective, that is 100 thousandth of a human hair far below any depth of field of any optical system. The DOF-5 can hit servo bandwidths of 400 to 500 hertz. And what this is key for is the ability to make focus corrections very quickly. We are able to make a 100 nanometer step in two and a half milliseconds and settle to plus or minus seven nanometers in that time. We'd invite you to learn more about the DOF-5 on our website. We have a white paper there that's interesting. And we also have a white paper that covers a lot of what we've discussed in this and earlier videos. Feel free to reach out to us for any design assistance in your next optical imaging application. And it is our goal to give you the highest performance, the highest throughput in images per second at a very modest cost. Thank you.